I remember the casting call, and I said, oh, Matt Groening is doing a brand new cartoon called Futurama. Being an American alive in the 90s, I knew who Matt Groening was. I mean, come on, this is a dude who changed American pop culture so much that he had to change his son's name because you couldn't be an eight-year-old boy in America named Homer. I just remembered being very intimidated, going, I'm in the same room with the guy who created The Simpsons. So my agents sent me over there, and I went in the room where everybody was going to audition, and there was about 100 people sitting there. I walked away from that thing going, I'm not going to get it. Fry and Leela were actually played by two different actors at first for the first pilot. They already cast Fry and Leela, but um, the casting didn't quite work out, and uh, I got the voice of Fry. I was perfectly happy with that, and then they told me I got the voice of this professor, Hubert Fodsworth, you know, 147 years old. Who are you? I'm your dear old Uncle Fry. I don't have an Uncle Fry. You do now. <laughs> Billy West has been promoted to the to the lead part. They need another utility voice guy, so I kind of slid into that slot they had for Billy because he was going to do everything. I played Morbo, the newscaster, Calculon, the star of all my circuits, uh, Lieutenant Kiff Croker, and also uh, oh, hedonism bot, yes, <laughs> the Don bot, and clamps. I'm going to give you the clamps, to name a few. The concept for Amy originally was that she was supposed to be kind of a very tough sort of butch car mechanic. And she was dressed that way in a car mechanic jumpsuit and just really tough. I'm not, that's not really my persona that I put out, you know, so when I met Matt, he's like, huh, well, we'll have to figure this out then. They made Amy a little bit softer, kind of free with her love. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And then they made Leela the tougher one. When Katie Seagal came on, that also fit perfectly with her, her persona. They created this, you know, bureaucrat accountant character named Hermes. If only there were a way to have one party for both of you here at the office, then write it off as a business expense. Who was not initially Jamaican. It was weird because it just wasn't quite working. Everybody else is getting a laugh. The accountant character's not really getting laughs. And we'd already had two actors be replaced. So after the third episode, when uh, it came down the hall and said, hey, you think you can do a Jamaican accent? The answer, of course, is yes. Yes, I can. Yeah. Zap Brannigan was going to be Phil Hartman. But unfortunately, you know. And Zap Brannigan was one of those, you know, they, they described him to me as um, if William Shatner ran the Enterprise and, and not James T. Kirk, you know. Kiff, pick up my underwear. Pushing everybody around, but kind of a coward and, uh, you know. Kiff, let them in. I made it with a woman. I remember the very first episode of Futurama. There is a scene where Billy, who plays three characters, one of his characters introduces another of his characters to the third one. So the entire scene was Billy. And we all just sat in the room and he did the entire thing in one take. Three different voices. And you watch it and you can't tell it's a single human being. It's just like, I can't do this. <laughs> what am I doing in the same room as him? You need an autograph? Why not Zeidberg? I remember the majority of recordings, it seemed like uh, we were pretty much all together, ensemble. The shows that care about the writing record the cast together because then you can hear how the lines sound bouncing off each other. Yeah, I just remember, um, you know, every time my character had to burp or make any kind of like bodily sound. <laughs> So either John or Maurice or, or you know, they, they're like experts at burping. And so then it would sound like this tiny girl made this gigantic burp. I played a goat, a two-headed goat who, uh, who vomits and defecates from each of its mouths. It's an effect I do that combines a sort of Tuvan uh, singing technique with turning my, my tongue inside out inside my cheeks to make a, an echo chamber. And it sounds something like this. I 
I also use that, uh, if it sounds familiar to your audience, I, I employed that on uh, in the movie Elf. I was the stunt burper for Will Ferrell, as well as the stunt burper for uh, Wacko on Animaniacs. So, the secret's out. Splick. Why is Mr. Chucks doing that? It took a couple of episodes before I realized, oh, this isn't just a comedy show. This is a straight up sci-fi. And I think that's actually one of the things that people responded to. And by people, I mean everyone except the Fox executives. I remember thinking, God, this is clever stuff. You know, the writing staff are all, you know, Harvard and, and Stanford, uh, MIT, you know, geniuses. That's what I love this, about the show the most is the writing. I, I'd never seen that kind of writing as far as humor. That's always my favorite kind of entertainment when things make you laugh and cry. And then, you, you know, it's kind of rare that, a, that an animated show would make you cry, but it certainly did for me. I thought the show really found its, its really warm emotional center with uh, the episode w with Fry's dog. Seymour will live again! <gasps> a little land mammal! Can you believe it, Bender? I'm gonna have my best friend back! Like, I knew it was gonna be sad. I even recorded it. But I had no idea how sad it was gonna play on TV, and I was like, everybody can relate to that situation. You know, we've all had pets, we bond with animals, and you want them to live forever, but they don't. So. You have to say hello and goodbye to a lot of good, darn good little friends, you know? David Cohen, uh, our, our executive producer, reads all the stage direction. And as he's reading this and we get to the end, I'm like, <laughs> that poor dog. You know, so that's, that, that to me was the big gooey emotional center of the show. Your emotions made him feel bad. You're right. I feel terrible. Oh, great. Now you're making them feel worse. It didn't have the automatic success, you know, per se, that The Simpsons had. Our, our show was more of an acquired taste, I think, and uh, but a super loyal, rabid fan base. The, the ones that did love us, loved us. The fans rallying together was gave us such a lift and bringing us back and then, you know, airing on Comedy Central. What a gift. The fact that it came back almost solely based on the fans. People kept watching it. People kept buying the DVDs and they realized, oh, there's an audience. They're like, yeah, we could have told you that. Whenever we came back to it, it felt like we were coming home. That was my favorite show I ever did. So the thought of it going off, I said, I'm going to have serious uh, separation anxiety. And I always did. And then when it came around again, I was raring to go all the time. I was down there on a racehorse, you know, to the session. Yeah, we're back. Yeah! The ending that, that we came up with for the series finale is probably the best possible ending. If it never comes back, we've left it so that when they re-enter the time stream, they can come back at any point. I would love to have Futurama come back in a bingeable version where all the episodes drop at the same time and people can start to get obsessed with it again and just let that steamroller keep going. Bingeable certainly is the, the, the way things are now. Um, I'd like to see it in a way that we can just beam it into people's brains directly and then they dream every episode every night. Just... <laughs>